You are listening to Living the Clover Life. Welcome back to another episode on Catholic Trivia. Let us begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, draw us deeper into the heart of your Son by the power of the Holy Spirit that we could know more truly who we are to you and who you want to be for us. Help us to discuss well and to to learn a lot about uh, what it is you have taught us through your church and the great tradition. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, episode one was so popular, <laughs> backed by popular demand, right? That and it's much easier, if I'm honest, to just respond to things <laughs> that is to prep a whole series. So uh, it was a it was a good episode last time, and we thought we would do it again. Yep, absolutely. So we have uh, some questions remaining from last time. Yeah. And also, we got some new questions. Dun, dun, dun. So, Which I also have not heard, just, just like last time. I've not heard these questions, seen these questions. So we'll see how we do. All so right. Let's dive in. <clears throat> let's just jump right in then. Uh, incorruptible saints. Mm-hmm. Question about that. Why some and not others? Why some and not others? That's a, that's a, that's above my pay grade. Ask God. Uh, I think when we're talking about the uh, nature of incorruptible saints, it's difficult to say exactly why. Like what, first and foremost, it is a kind of a, a foretaste of the resurrection of the body at the end of time. Uh, and the fact that like Mary, when God created humanity, we weren't intended to die, right? Our bodies weren't intended to corrupt. And so it's both reaching back to Eden and forward to uh, the resurrection of the dead. However, why did this saint saint's body degrade and why did this saint's body remain? Well, I don't think the church has definitively declared it. In fact, I know they haven't, but we can also surmise that it may have something to do with the message that God wants to continue to share with the world through that person. And sometimes that person's holiness is highlighted in that way. So God is a generous God and sometimes seeks to to glorify his friends. You could argue uh, that maybe it has to do with like a particular aspect of purity of heart, whereas someone might be very holy, they might struggle with purity of heart in terms of like full intention towards the Lord versus uh, this saint who uh, maybe holds on a bit more to their uh, fallen nature, but they're still a saint. Where like, it, may, it may be degrees of, of interior purity. I don't know. Uh, that's just a theory that you could throw out there. But ultimately, it's God speaking about his ultimate and good plan for us when we respond and we're in a relationship with him, which is basically taking us back to Eden and forward to uh, eternal life and the resurrection of the body. All right. Good answer. So another question that we have from our listeners. Our, our esteemed and highly intelligent listeners. Absolutely. <laughs> and some of these questions also came from Mrs. Kane's eighth grade uh, okay. religious class. <laughs> Who I'm sure are also listeners too. Very wise. What does the use of incense mean during mass and mm. when in history was it started? So incense is has a very rich, rich history. And I think we should probably pull Father Claussen in to, to really dive into that. But ultimately, when you look at incense, incense is used in many, many religions, even in Old Testament times. So pagan religions, the Jewish tradition has a ton of incense usage as well. And incense traditionally, uh, just in terms of how humans tend to view incense, it's, it's in this way. One, it's a mysterious thing. Um, it points to a source in terms of like a fire, and it also rises up. And in our human kind of way of understanding things, heaven and the sacred things are up, right? They're not down. And so with that, you also have a beautiful scent that's a part of it. So when I burn uh, this particular incense, it, it smells very nice, it smells like roses, it smells like cedar, um, incense, myrrh, what have you. That is intended to draw us up to heavenly things on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also meant to point to our prayers and, and our worship as being kind of a fire that raises up this smoke to heaven. So our prayers rise like incense. And then it also has the effect of making things mysterious, right? Now that, that seems kind of weird to say, but emotionally, when if you go out into a foggy field in the morning, uh, there's this beautiful mist everywhere and the sun is rising and things are kind of obscured there is almost a, a heightened spiritual sense in those moments. Like, like things are, are not quite clear and there's a, a beauty and a mystery about it. Same thing is happening when it's uh, incense is used at mass, depending on the priest and depending on who's putting in the uh, 
incense amount, there can be quite a bit of <laughs> uh, blockage of the altar, but it kind of reminds us of the veil between heaven and earth, right? Uh, although at, in Eden, there was this complete unity between heaven and earth. Now there is this, this distinction and we want to be reminded of that. So we acknowledge and realize that we're entering into something holy. We are both uh, rising our prayers up, but acknowledging the both the closeness and the transcendence of God in our in our worship of Him. So, beautiful sense remind us of beautiful things. Of course, it creates an atmosphere no matter where. It's not just on a practical level. Like you can be in a gym having mass, and you put incense in there, and all of a sudden it's it's a, it's a different space. Kind of like music, actually, I, I would say, because music can change a space based upon uh, how, what type of music is played. Lighting can change it. Also scent and sight, are, which are both affected by incense, can change it and can dispose us because we have bodies, right? We're not just souls. We're, we are bodies and souls. And so therefore our body, when it interacts beautiful with beautiful things, it's drawn upward to the things of God. Sure. Yeah. And I know it's not a requirement, of mass. Right. So, so it, it is and it isn't. So it actually is intended to be used at every single mass. So, so for a mm. while after Vatican II, or after the introduction of the Novus Ordo, incense wasn't used, which is interesting because in the rite, it actually says you should use incense at this time, you should use incense at this time, and so on and so on. It's just been a preference thing that has not, did not, uh, did not make the, the jump. So as with- Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's actually intended to be used at every mass. Now you can argue that there's, at least as I understand it, you can argue that there's a, a a way in which you can focus on the solemnity of a particular feast by adding more candles and adding more incense and so on. But at least at high masses or, or, or like solemnity masses and Sunday mass is always a solemnity mass because it is always a celebration of our Lord's resurrection, uh, which we could get into all kinds of conversations about Lent and whether or not you should you know keep your fast and Lent on Sunday, which I don't, by the way. The, the, the My mother will be very happy to hear that. <laughs> she was very adamant that you don't have to keep your fast on Sunday. Right. The, the, but, the, but the idea that Sunday is a solemnity, so there is no higher feast really than, than Sunday because it's, it's celebrating the resurrection, the coming, and the, and the triumph of Christ. We, have, we, in a particular way, acknowledge it at Easter and at, and at Christmas, but they are all pointing to that, that high solemnity. And so incense was intended to be used at every high solemnity mass. All right. Well, let's keep this uh, mass topic going with another question that we had, which is more of uh, maybe an apologetics question. Okay. How do you respond to a Catholic who is thinking about finding a Christian church, perhaps non-denominational church, Mm -hmm. to go to because they can't focus during or don't get a lot out of mass? Okay. So it's a great question. And I think there's a couple of of ways that we have to approach this. One is approaching it with truth and the other is approaching it with love. And obviously there's so many different, like, is this your mother? Is this your child? Is this a friend? Like like, like all those dynamics play in as well. So you're going to have to discern those on your own. But the, the truths that I would lay out are what's happening at mass is not dependent upon my feelings or focus. My ability to receive certainly is is affected by those things because we have to be intentionally engaged. But I also think we need to understand that we want to enter in with God into the deepest part of ourself and not only, and I, and I emphasize only, with our easily accessible emotions. Now, that's not to say that emotions should not be expressed at mass. It's not to say that our emotions shouldn't be engaged. They should be, right? Uh, I always tell people, you know, when you go to a football game and you're cheering and you're, you're, you know, roaring out loud, that's worship, right? You're, you're essentially worshiping what's happening on that field. And if you're not willing to give that same level of ardor and zeal and devotion to God, um, there's something problematic. Not that I'm encouraging everyone to shout in mass, but like that's the state of our hearts should be willing and, and able to engage in that with the Lord. And so sometimes that's what people are looking for when they're going to another church. They want another atmosphere, right? They want another environment. They want better music or different style of music. And, and while I acknowledge that those are those are not bad things to, to, for our hearts to desire, ultimately we have to acknowledge the greatest good of what's going on at Mass, and that is Holy Eucharist. And if you don't believe that Jesus is present in his precious body, blood, soul, and divinity, really and truly, and then received by you, if you don't believe that, then yeah, there is there is no point to to, to being at a, at a Catholic church. Um, not that I'm encouraging people to leave, but it, but if you don't see the difference between what's happening here at a Catholic church and what's going on at a at a Protestant church, 
then I understand why you might see it as, well, they're both kind of equal. But we're both, you know, loving Jesus and, and I'm just going to go to this church because I enjoy it more. Or I, 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 I get more out of the preaching. Even you could say, um, I, I prefer this pastor's preaching to my, my current priest's teaching and preaching. Well, again, ultimately there's this question of, is Jesus physically and, and divinely present there? He is only and uniquely present where there are legitimate sacraments um, in at least sacramentally, Jesus is always present in his people. He's always present in the word. And that's a good thing. But in the full expression of who Jesus is, we get it all in the mass, right? We get him in the Eucharist, which is the, the fullest physical expression of him that we have. Uh, we get him in his people who are worshiping and we get him in the word that is proclaimed. You also have to consider, um, and there's many, many, many books that I don't have time to go, go into right now, but all the, all the facts and the history points to this. Jesus founded one church. He didn't found a bunch of different churches. Jesus founded one church. And that one church has one founder, again, Jesus. If you go to another church, if you go to a Lutheran church, if you go to a Baptist church, if you go to a non-denominational church, you can go back and find that denomination or church's founder. And that founder is not Jesus. That It's a church founded by uh, um, usually a man who wanted to change things from the way he was worshiping in the church that he was a part of. And again, sometimes the the men that did that and, and the women that did that had legitimate concerns about what was going on in their parish or in their, their, their church morally, or, or uh, they had questions. And sometimes those questions weren't answered well, but ultimately uh, one of the greatest evils the Bible teaches us is Christian disunity. So in uh, the book of first Timothy, I think it is, there's this, this statement that Christ desires that we all be one and we don't want to divide ourselves into, into factions. Now, as Catholics, that doesn't mean that we don't love our brothers and sisters who are part of different denominations. They are Christian if they are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if they're seeking to follow Jesus, we want to embrace them and to walk alongside them. But we also have to acknowledge that in some ways they are at least even if they don't feel this way, they are objectively starving. So you wouldn't want to see one of your siblings who is truly your, your, your sibling go out and live in the street, right? And starve uh, and, and, and feel like they were being happy, right? You'd be concerned for them. You, you would want good, better things for them. Not that there aren't good things in, in Protestant churches. There are. 100% there are people who I would argue are more devoted to Jesus. Not I'm not saying every single person, but there are people who in Protestant churches who are more devoted to Jesus than some people who are living in the Catholic church, right? So that that's a matter of personal righteousness and piety and, and devotion to the Lord. Anyone who is deeply in love with Jesus is always going to receive more at a Catholic church. And here's why. Again, we have Jesus fully present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. We have the sacraments that are a certain and guaranteed mode of grace. Not that God can't act outside the sacraments. He does and can, but he is guaranteed and, and, and has established these very certain and particular ways in which he wants and desires to pour out his love upon us in a unique way that's only found when the sacraments are present. That's kind of a long answer. Uh, that's, that's the kind of truth side of things. All of this has to be expressed in terms of love for the other person and in terms of invitation. And so I would say if, if you have a friend that's in that situation, ask them to study, to do a Bible study with you about the Eucharist. Ask them to, 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 to read a book with you. And we can't just say, here's the answers, go figure it out. We have to accompany people. We, we Having the right answers, which I'm really bad about, right? I, I love just, oh, there's the right answer. You can go figure it out, right? We have to walk alongside people. And that, 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 it's a challenge, right? Because it, there's an inconvenience to that, or there, there's an obligation to that, or it takes time. But we're not just called to have the right answers. We're called to walk the walk. And walking alongside someone who has questions about their faith can actually lead to them coming and entering into their faith in a deeper way than they ever would have before because they asked the question, right? Because they said, you know, why can't I just leave? That question is a great opportunity for an answer and a full and complete reunification of their will and, and experience in the church. That's beautiful. Thank you. Isn't the church beautiful? The church is beautiful. <laughs> and Our... scandalous. That's, that, that's the crazy thing is the church is both beautiful and scandalous, right? Because there's imperfect people in the church sure. and, and, and there's tough things happening in the church. And yet, in spite of it all, Christ chose us as his bride. Amen. So, Nathaniel, sometimes there are two readings at mass and sometimes there is only one. 
Why is this? So that refers to the solemnity. The sh- short answer to this is uh, when there's a solemnity, there are two readings um, to acknowledge the, the grace of that thing that's being celebrated. You mentioned fasting earlier. Let's go back to fasting. Uh, we did have a question about fasting before mass. Mm-hmm. And this person says that they only recently learned that if they put milk in their coffee, it's not considered fasting. Correct. But if they drink black coffee, it's okay. So my what's your opinion on that? Yeah, my understanding is that it should be water. Water. Um, we, okay. we should we should drink water because that's what's necessary for the sustaining of life. Anything else is secondary. So uh, if you want to drink your coffee, drink it an hour before communion. All right, getting off the topic of mass okay. and fasting. <laughs> uh, this is actually a question that I've heard many times before from people, and um, interested to hear your answer on it. So, sure. what happens to our animals after they pass away. Right. So when we look at the the creation story and we look at, at the, the fact that um, death entered the world when uh, sin happened, that doesn't necessarily mean that there weren't predators and prey in the animal animal world before that. And so this idea of living eternally seems to be, and, and T- Thomas Aquinas talks about this, seems to be uh, focused primarily on the human person. So the reality is that all good is found in God. And so therefore, if we have a particular love of, of, a, of an animal, and that's not a wrong thing to, to, to do, by the way, um, that goodness and whatever joy and grace we found in them will still be found in heaven in the person uh, and in the persons of God. So animals do have souls, but they don't have eternal souls, if that makes sense. So just as every natural thing in this world is essentially not God in the sense that we should worship it, but it is God manifesting his love and grace and goodness. So if you have a labradoodle that you love, uh, for example, and that labradoodle shows you so much love and affection, that is God loving you through that animal. So when that animal dies, that animal is merely an expression of God's love. And that expression of love is not going to to be absent in heaven because it will still be there. So uh, you might think of this also with regard to angels, which is a little bit different, but angels are meant to carry out and to bring God's love and truth into the world. Um, God loves to work through intermediaries. So just like God loves to work through you and through me, God loves to work through animals as well, both to provide us with nourishment and to uh, accompany us, to help us with work and labor. So when you look at the natural world, like and, and even not, not even animals, you look at a tree and you say, oh, that tree is producing fruit and it's producing wood and, and it's just beautiful. All of those things are manifestations of God's love for his children, humanity. And so when that thing passes away in this world, it's still present in the person of God, because in the first place, it was only and ever, if it was good, it was only and ever an expression of God's goodness in the world, if that makes sense. So uh, the particular animal doesn't live forever, but what the animal actually is, which is an expression of God's love for you, does live on in the person of God. All right, great. Nathaniel. Yes. Why April. should you not take communion more than once a day? Is it wrong or just not necessary? Great question. So there's a number of things in the life of the church that are just guided by by sound prudence. So, for example, a, a priest should not say a million masses a day. Why? It would be, be great to say as many masses as you could a day just to bless people. Okay. Practically speaking, however, what happens? Well, the priest becomes a mass machine, and the mass becomes lifeless. It becomes unintentional, and it becomes just uh, empty, right? And when we just say empty words... It's not as as fruitful, and we want our priests to be praying the Mass, right, in a loving and reverent way to where there's great fruit from it, but also uh, to where they're, they are feeding uh, flock their flock by it. Okay, so as it relates to us receiving communion, in the same way, we don't want to, on the one hand, be overly familiar with the Eucharist and like, oh, I just need it all the time. We also don't want to be uh, scrupulous, and that's a fancy word for uh, saying like having an ill-formed conscience that tries to make sure, like you go to confession every two hours, right? That would be a problematic, scrupulous thing because, you know, we have to trust to God's mercy. So God himself has entered your body when you receive communion. You are able to receive it twice a day, as I understand it, so long as you are either ministering at that Mass 
or it is a different liturgy. So for example, if I go to mass on just as just happened on Sunday morning, and then that evening is Christmas vigil mass, I'm receiving ma- uh, the Eucharist at uh, two different liturgies on the same 24 hour period. And you uh, might see that a lot too, on if you go to a Saturday morning daily mass, right? and then the Saturday evening, the uh, vigil for Sunday, Correct. that's going to be two different liturgies. Correct. And although all masses are bound together outside of time, there are different expressions of that same, uh, of that same and eternal sacrifice of Christ. So it's not wrong per se. However, one has to question why one is doing it. And if we're just doing it to make ourselves feel good or because we're worried about something, it probably isn't uh, as as much fruit as there otherwise could be. Because although we receive the full infinite presence of God within ourselves when we receive the Eucharist, the fruitfulness of that sacrament being received depends entirely upon our openness to that grace and our delight in and our reverence for that that grace. So uh, if we become too familiar with it, it that becomes less or it, that the, the problem is it can become less. Sure. A tendency can be to, for it to be less, uh, well, for us to be less responsive to, to Jesus. Nathaniel, you're so knowledgeable. Oh, I thank you. First of all, <laughs> I haven't stumped you yet. There was a couple I kept thinking, he's really going to have to think about it, but this, this podcast is going to need hardly any editing at all. There you go. All right. And, and trust me, people, he is not looking up these answers on Google. I Google. Well, he does not have a computer. He, he just is a knowledge of information. A font of wisdom. That's right. right. A, a font of information. That's exactly right. All right. So the final question I have for you today is what is the difference between an apostle and a disciple of Christ? That's a great question. So it's actually very appropriate to kind of end on well, biblically speaking, it is kind of complicated because Jesus' followers included the 12 apostles, right, as, as we know them, and they were the first bishops, including the first pope. However, there were Jesus' other followers who were called his disciples, and sometimes that word disciple is used to describe the 12 because they were his disciples too, and disciple just means student. So if you go to the Latin, um, disciple, discipulus, is the is the Latin term for those of you who want to be fancy and impress people at a cocktail party. Fancy like you, uh, yes, Nathaniel. Yes, fancy like me. Yes. Uh, so discipulus, discipuli, or discipula if you're a girl. A disciple essentially is someone who is trying to model their life on the knowledge or the person that they are following. And so when you were the student of a rabbi uh, in the ancient Hebrew tradition, you were, you were uh, said to follow him so closely that he would be covered from the dust of his sandals so that you'd everything that he did, you would be imitating and trying to, to draw closer intention to. So every Christian is a disciple of Jesus. However, not everyone is an apostle. So an apostle is used in two ways in the New Testament. One way includes both and the other is a little bit distinct. So bear with me. The, the first apostles, the 12 apostles, they are the first bishops and again, the first Pope, Peter. Now, that also is combined with a charism. So there's a charism of the Holy Spirit that is to have an apostolic calling. And to be an apostle in that sense, and indeed in the sense of the early church disciple, uh, early church apostles as well, um, the, the 12 apostles, is to spread and establish the kingdom of God in a very intentional, concrete way. So for example, founding a church or um, founding a Christian community or, uh, you know, establishing an organizational structure for your diocese or whatever, that is the gift, the the charismatic gift of uh, having an apostolic calling or apostolic office. So a layman can, I would argue, have an apostolic office today. So you, you can be an apostle today and be a layman. However, that only is true for a Catholic, at least, when we are acting within the confines and, and under the authority as given by God himself, let's remember, of the appointed bishop of that region. Interesting, Nathaniel. Do you think you could give us a modern day example of that? So I think the best example, the easiest example would be a someone who is a missionary and establishing the the reign of Christ and and Christian communities within the context of a place where Christians are persecuted and there is no active or present bishop. However, the church has, I think, essentially established bishoprics all over the world, even if it's a place where there there is no um, 
Christian presence anymore. So for example, in a lot of Muslim countries, uh, basically the officials in Rome will be given an honorary title of Bishop of, you know, Saudi Arabia, and there are no bishops in Saudi Arabia because it's a Muslim country that doesn't allow it. So the, uh, at least as, as far as I know, but there are many, many countries like that. For instance, Iran would be the, the probably the easiest example. But then there's also places that have never been evangelized formally. Like, uh, let's say we were to go to Mars and we discovered there were people on Mars and we didn't, hadn't established a bishop there yet. And one of the astronauts just f- had felt inspired and called by the Holy Spirit to evangelize the people there and to, to spread the gospel. He could do that in a way and would establish Christian community but then would reach back to the church in a way to partner with priests and deacons and, and, and bishops and the, and the, the Holy See, of course, to establish a, a more formal, uh, how can I put this, a, a more formal diocese there to, to provide for the official institutional needs of the church. So apostolic persons tend to be very much founders. They're great at starting things and then letting them go. So like founding a Christian community or, or starting a movement and then empowering other people to take on the the grace and the gift that they are, they're kind of uh, imparted to that. Another good example would be, um, there's a man named Patrick Reese who founded Encounter School of Ministries. And he is definitely spreading the good news everywhere, establishing organizations, assisting other organizations. But again, he's, he's a layman. He's not a deacon. He's not a priest. He's not a bishop. But in, in many, many ways, the impact of his life is to spread the kingdom, which every disciple is meant to, right? Every disciple is meant to do that to some degree. Some have a particular call. And the way that might manifest, let's say that I uh, were to go to, you know, let's just use the example of Saudi Arabia, and the grace of the Holy Spirit is on me in that particular way. And I go to the local official and I say, hey, I want to start a, a Christian community here. And uh, I wanted to, to, to gain your approval to do that. It's against the law, by the way, to do that. But if the grace of the Holy Spirit were on him in such a way that the official were to look at him and say, ah, oh, well, I guess if you keep it quiet. Like, like there's, there's a grace, a very specific yeah. grace that follows it that is unique to that calling and to that charism, which is a bit different than the call of the bishop. But hopefully the bishop has that as well. So that's a very complicated uh, <laughs> answer to a, to a somewhat simple question. But all of us, by dint of our baptism, are disciples of Jesus. And this is a great way to actually minister and evangelize is, you know, you can always say that you're a student, right? People like to help students out. Hey, I, I'm a student. You, know, you mind if I, I, I you know, ask you some questions? I'm just taking a survey. And this can be true. I would do this in your life, right? Ask, like, do you know who Jesus is? Like, like, if I would ask you who Jesus is, do you know who he is? Oh, okay. I'm getting information on, on what people uh, want to know. What And I part of my assignment, because it is, because you're, you're a disciple of Jesus, right? Your assignment is to spread the kingdom. I have this assignment to, you know, kind of teach a little bit once I learn what people know or don't know. And all of this to say, there's many, many wonderful and delightful ways in which we can live truly as students. We never have to be the master. We never have to have it all figured out. Um, we don't all have to, to, you know, speak on podcasts. We don't all have to, you know, work at church, but all of us are meant to work as disciples in the world, expanding the kingdom. So, yeah, I, I this has been fun. Awesome. <laughs> we should do no, this, this again is, sometime. This has been fun. <laughs> Well, Nathaniel, I think that's a wrap on all of our questions. Awesome. I do want to thank everybody who submitted questions. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely. had some really good questions over awesome. these last two episodes, and I personally learned a lot. Yeah. So Nathaniel apparently already knew everything, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, God is gracious. Uh, and you know, that, that's a beautiful thing. We always have to keep learning about our faith and, and never be afraid to ask the question, right? It, I forget the saint that said this, but something along the lines of the greatest sin is not to ask the question, right? Because if we don't ask the question, we don't enter fully into to, into belief, right? If we never actually seek to know, then we can't come to know our good Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son who are in heaven and, and desire to affect our lives. Um, it, hopefully, you were blessed by this. If you were, ask that you would share, like, subscribe. You know, help us to continue to make Jesus famous and, and His Church. Um, as we continue this ministry, it's just a, a real blessing to us, and we hope that it continues to bless you. So, until next time, keep living. You've been listening to Living the Clover Life. For more information about St. Malachi Catholic Parish, check out our website at stmalachy.org. S-T-M-A-L-A-C-H-Y dot org.